Hello, Global Gardeners. It's Monday. It's time to start your gardening week, and we're here live. I think we're going to have a great show today. We have a wonderful guest, and it's going to be interactive, and there's actually going to be some gifts involved along the way. So stick with us. We've just experienced daylight savings time here in the United States, and so I'm guessing some of our foreign listeners are going to be joining us a little bit late, but you can always catch up on replay anything that you miss. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and welcome Charles Malky. Good morning, Charles. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me here. Oh, it's gonna... wonderful. And and uh, Charles, you, I think, are, are ideal for what I like to do with this, this live stream. I I like to promote smaller channels and I like to promote family owned businesses and your YouTube channel is actually not so small anymore. <laughs> it's actually growing quite, quite a bit, but your company IV Organic is one of those companies I think has a lot to offer and we'll be talking about fertilizers over the course of the day and other help that we can give gardeners. But I really like the family aspect of your business. And so let's start with the name, IV Organic. How did you come up with that name? No, that's wonderful. Thank you so very much um, again for having us. And the um, the I and the V in IV Organic, uh, most people see it as for organic. and um, But that was actually not the thing that really caught us. The reason we went with IV Organics and our family immediately jumped on the name and the opportunity to um, make that our brand is because of my two young daughters, age now 13 and nine. Um, the youngest was actually two or one when we started, and their names are Isabel and Victoria. And um, they have a hand in almost, I don't want to say our day to day, but at least our week to week. And initially, more so our day to day as our company quickly grew. Um, you know, to becoming America's largest um, gardening YouTube channel in the country. Um, and um, and it really all happened just because of the support and the love we got from gardeners across America and truly around the world as our products are now parked in um, warehouses in about nice. five other countries outside of America as well right now. Nice, nice. And your wife is the CEO. And wife is the CEO. It's a woman-owned company, 100%. I work very hard for her. Um, and that's kind of the structure of the way we started. And um, it continues to run to this very day. Nice, nice. And yeah. your channel is not just selling your products. You you have a number of videos that you, you talk about trees. You have guests on that are other parts of your videos as well. And you've actually written a book about gardening. So it's more than just you selling products. Well, show your book. Here's the book. Um, so Saving the World with the Home Garden. And the um, what the book generally summarizes is we've now got about 400, maybe 400 and I think it's 40 videos right now on the Ivory Organics YouTube channel. Um, again, we started in 2015. And so in regards to small company, I consider us, we're still small. We still got we're still at the beginning of all that needs to be done to be truly competitive in the gardening um, business. Um, but we do work closely with Omri, which is, you know, the organic, you know, um, standard for organic orchards in America. And we do work with commercial organic orchards. We do work with obviously um, organic backyard growers, um, such as myself and my neighbors and you. Um, and, you know, again, we're still just right at the beginning. And again, it's with the love and the support of, yeah. growers again predominantly across america but again also around the world that has brought us like into the spotlight and so the books really what it does is it summarizes in 10 chapters the 10 concepts i seem to be repeating over and over again in these um lessons so for those of you that want to watch 440 videos or just read the book you can kind of get the idea of the principles that i teach that should hopefully make you a successful grower wherever you are and again, about saving the world with the backyard, um, you know, in regards to saving the world with, you know, as a home gardener, mm -hmm. the um, principle behind it is there's a lot of growers and I teach a lot of gardening classes for, I'd say, about last 15 to 20 years. And I teach about the importance of organic gardening. And then people call me when they go to the big box store and they're like, is this product organic? And it's like, if you can just 
read the ingredients so know they're, they're not, whether it be a fertilizer or a pesticide or whatever it is that they're using. And the goal at the end of the day is whether you're growing food or you're growing ornamentals such as roses or anything else, the goal is to do it the best you can. You have a chance to actually, you know, make an impression on your own property and on your own health. And that is going to ultimately affect the community. And if you're doing things with synthetics and sometimes referred to as chemical, you know, products, you're not just affecting your own property, you're affecting your neighbors and you're affecting your community and the one ocean that we, you know, and the one planet we all share. And so that's why um, the goal is when gardening, you have a chance to actually do things right by using the right products sure. on your backyard and your front yard orchards. Um, and gardens rather than using the synthetic chemical stuff that are going to leave residue on our planet that's going to affect us all. Awesome. Let, let's go ahead and get to the first question. Thank that's you to good. Pat Patrick for that super chat. He's wondering, what advantage is there, if any, between composted cow maneuver over composted mushroom that's bagged? Um, so the difference between cow manure and, and mushroom, obviously one is going to be a animal source versus other, the other one is going to be a vegan source. Um, the, N, the NPK, which is what most of the growers in the world are using as standards, might be a little bit different. I would think that the animal, um, the cow manure is going to be a little higher in nitrogen, right. whereas the mushroom compost is going to be a more balanced NPK product. Um, so those are like the alternatives, you know, to, to look for when comparing yeah. the two. And there's also typically another component. Most of the compost that we get, even the bagged compost that is pretty sterile, is bacterial based. It's the bacteria that breaks down the organic matter, where if it's true mushroom compost, it tends to be woodier and it's the fungi that's breaking down the wood. And so using both of those in conjunction might not actually be a, be a bad idea because you'd have a bacterial dominant compost that comes from the animal product and then you'd have a fungal dominant material that comes from the the mushroom and balancing both of those in your soil can actually be a pretty good idea absolutely one of the top three things that most people um, gardeners are looking for in regards to a healthy soil or a healthy compost um, typically involves having like you know your earthworms that you see usually you want to see that there's life in the soil but there's actually per square inch or per square foot there's actually more beneficial bacteria in healthy soil than there are earthworms um, and then the other thing you're looking for is also the mycorrhiza and the cool thing for those gardeners that see mushrooms popping up in your garden um, bear in mind that a mushroom can have hypha, which are those roots that can span up to a thousand feet. So a single mushroom can be networking pretty much all of your plants on your property. And what it does is it helps balance the water throughout your garden. It helps balance the nutrients within your garden. Um, so having mushrooms and maybe starting with a mushroom compost, if it happens to have spores, can potentially help also um, stimulate and, and add more to that mycorrhizal network within your garden. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I, you know, I live in a very dry region here in Colorado and we have a brief period of the year, usually in spring when, when the rains actually come and keep things moist for a while. But I love that time of year when those mushrooms pop up because it's telling me my soil is, is happy and you have all of that, that growth under, underneath the ground that you can't even see. So you're, you're totally right. The shocking thing is I know a lot of gardeners that go and level them or they go and they buy, you know, fungicides and stuff and try to destroy the mushrooms on the property, not knowing the value that that's actually adding to the backyard or organic garden. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit more about the nutrients and and we'll start off by focusing on fertilizer. We'll move to lots of other things because you've just got so much interesting background that I'd like to delve into today. So let's start with this interactive activity and and we talked about the npk and you just mentioned that the nitrogen the phosphorus and the potassium and so what charles has agreed to do is is offer a giveaway and so he's going to post a question and go ahead and in the comments put your answer and then i'll go back and review and whoever gets the the answer correct first i'll I'll ask you, well, actually, I'll ask all of you, go ahead and send me to gardenerscott at gardenerscott.com if you've answered the question. 
but if I see the correct answer first, I'll go ahead and point it out to you and make sure that, that you send to me, but it may happen so fast that I miss the first person, which is why I'll have to go back. But uh, I'll announce next week who the winners are, and you can send me your contact information at Gardner Scott at gardnerscott.com and then we'll get something out to you so when we're talking about nutrients it's not as well known that nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium are the only things we need they're macronutrients but what's your question charles so to continue on with that theme here's the question and we're looking for the first person to write down the answer to this and it reads what are the six macronutrients all plants need? And we're looking for the person, you can just write the, you know, the letter of the element that each of the elements start with, such as, you know, Gardner Scott already gave you the first three, the NPK for N is nitrogen, P is phosphorus, and K is potassium. We need six. Plants need six macronutrients. So let's see who's going to... Okay. And so the reason that this is appropriate today is because IV Organic has fertilizer and your fertilizer includes all six macronutrients, which makes it relatively unique. I'm sure you've got the market market research to see what other companies out there are doing it. But in your experience from the business side of it, uh, are there others out there that are offering organic and all six macronutrients? So the answer is going to be yes, but I would say we're one of the only companies in the country that market ourselves as having all six plant macronutrients in our product. The tradition across America and around the world, and I've seen so many YouTube lessons where gardeners are giving their expert advice and saying plants have three macronutrients, and I'm like, so wrong and for those of you that if the answer hasn't gone up already i've taught at so many garden nurseries and i've had experts that have been teaching gardening for decades and they, again they still adhere to that npk as being the only three nutrients that plants need and you can go to google and simply write in plant macronutrients and you're going to see that there's going to be six and i'm and the thing that shocked us and this is not our primary product that we um brought to market in 2015 but it was a hole that we saw in the market that we felt that we needed to fill. And that's how our basically six macros plus was the original um, brand name. But as we got the army certification, as we're working with, um, you know, different departments of agriculture and stuff, we basically had to continuously make revisions to the point that we've got, you know, our new label, which is basically um, I'll hold the product up here. This is the Ivory Organics All Purpose. Basically, there's a 333 product, which is our super blend. And then the second product over here is the premium blend. So the super and premium blend. The premium blend has a lower NPK. You can see the 222. But both products have all six plant macronutrients. And what's unique about the super blend, if I can keep it up, is that it has plus azomite. For those of you gardeners that use mm -hmm. azomite, you'll know the value that azomite is simply crushed volcanic rock. And, you know, just like the plants in Hawaii that, you know, benefit from all of those micronutrient uh, minerals that are very important in the metabolic processes and enzyme, you know, chain reactions within the plant. And so having that volcanic crushed rock also delivers a lot of the micronutrient nutrition to your plant as well, in addition to the six macronutrients. So that's our, our super blend product and then our premium blend products. Um, to kind of just explain the difference between the two. And so as, I, as I'm as i reviewing the, the comments, it looks like Wormulus is the first to add magnesium, sulfur, and calcium. So what do you say about that? So let's pull up the answer. And I do see it as well. Um, so NPK, MGSCA. For those of you, um, you know, that are learning this for the first time, magnesium is the heart of the chlorophyll molecule, sulfur, there's a lot of products that, you know, they'll apply to their lawns, but you can apply it to your plants as well. That helps with the greening of the plant. Very important in the metabolic processes of the plants as well. And then calcium um, per, you know, per weight of the plant is going to consist of about 30% of the weight of all plants. So all plants need calcium where most gardeners think it's only in their tomatoes 
They need calcium in order to prevent this tomato disease known as tomato blossom end rot. So, mm -hmm. um, but calcium is basically in the cell walls is where you'll find the most concentration of calcium within the plant. And again, it consists of up to 30% of the plant's dry weight. So these are the six macronutrients that soil should have um, for optimal health growth, you know, and performance, longevity, and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it isn't one or the other, or if you have more calcium, it's better than more sulfur. It's, it's the fact that all plants need all of these. And I think it's just so much of the focus on MBK because that's what the big producers do with their synthetic fertilizer. So let's move into that realm when we are talking synthetic fertilizer versus organic fertilizer. What makes yours organic versus synthetic? And, and what's the key difference? Well, for one, we pay to have Omri, you know, review the product <laughs> and make sure that it's Omri certified so the organic commercial orchards can rely on it without certifications. Um, but you backyard growers can also rely on the fact that they are organic products so you can, you know, produce organic produce. At the end of the day, the goal <laughs> is to, whether again, it's your edibles or if it's your ornamentals, is to grow the best and the healthiest food. Um, many of us, you know, might not be able to afford going to Whole Foods, but the issue with Whole Foods, let's say, with their organic produce, and it's not usually all their produce is organic. They also have next to their organic, the conventionally grown, which means they've used synthetic products in the, you know, in the growing of some of those um, fruits that you're buying from Whole Foods. But the goal for your backyard is to be growing the best, highest quality food. And at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're growing your health. And that's the ultimate goal. Most of us have known over the last at least three, if not five or 10 years, that the cost of junk food is has gone like down, like it's, it's, it's very affordable to buy junk food, but to buy health is now becoming expensive. And, um, and look at healthcare, for example. Mm -hmm. And, um, but to like, I saw a post recently on in, in a Facebook forum where, you know, someone juiced kale and made like six jars of kale. And they're like, how much, you know, did it cost to make six jars of kale? And he said, $450, <laughs> you know, but to get a Big Mac, you know, you can keep your belly full for just a couple of bucks. So it's like, why is, you know, why, why is junk food, you know, cost becoming affordable, but our health is becoming expensive. And this is, I think, where, you know, growing your own food, instead of like maintaining a lawn, you could be like basically picking stuff every single day and offsetting at least a single meal. You know, with Absolutely. a small property that can improve your health and give you, you know, less disease and a longer, better quality life. And so um, so the goal is like to really grow the best you can when it comes to synthetics. It goes right along the same line of, you know, first, you've got to grow the best you can. And, and organic obviously will always trump synthetics when it comes to fertilizers. A lot of people say, do the plants know? Um and even if the plant doesn't know, the soil absolutely does know. Because if you're yeah. putting chemical or like, you know, the stuff that glows in the dark, I don't want to give any other name brands that are doing the synthetic stuff. I'm hoping yeah. you look at the that. That might be one of the of, primary colors. Yeah, yeah. One of those. So, you know, you know what I'm talking about. But the goal with um, the synthetic stuff is if you put the synthetic stuff in the soil, you're not feeding the earthworms, you're not feeding the beneficial bacteria and you're not feeding the mycorrhiza. What you're doing, in fact, is you're potentially harming that soil network. And again, you're messing up the health and longevity of the plants that are relying on these synthetic sources for minerals compared to if you did it organically, um, it'll create a more balanced structure below the soil that'll give your plant much more health, stability and, and performance. So um, that's just one big one aside from the runoff and the contamination that is going to leave your property using the synthetics that will end up in lakes, rivers and streams and ultimately the one ocean that we share. And again, these half life of a lot of these synthetics, you know, they just don't break down and they end up just adding more pollutants to our environment. Absolutely. And so you talked that you've got warehouses in other countries. Rob's allotment gardening is is a channel from the UK and he's wondering can you get ivy organic in the uk so we ship to the uk all the time we are we had our products in warehouses in the uk amazon is one where you can maybe try to shop there i think i've seen some sales going through um that particular platform in the uk um we're probably about a month or two away from landing um more um warehouses there our number one 
um, outside of the UK um, location that we have is um, is Australia. We've been doing very well in Australia for okay. about three to four years. A few months ago, we got the Arab Emirates, um, and we're looking to expand, you know, from there into Kuwait and a few other countries there. Um, and then, obviously, for Europe, we're looking at absolutely UK. In addition to France and Italy, I think are the next three in Spain um, for hopefully getting um, products there, and hopefully in time for spring and summer. Nice, nice. Yeah. Uh, Bettina is saying you you are what you eat and absorb, and it's the same for plants. And when when I think of the synthetic and organic comparison, the the big companies that are making the NPK synthetic fertilizers, it's like eating jelly beans and cotton candy. It's it's going to give you that quick burst of energy, and the plants are going to get that quick burst, but the organic fertilizers in particular, like you said, it's all about the soil. You're feeding the soil rather than feeding the plant. And so it it's like going to that vegan buffet where it's all nice, healthy food and it helps us in our diet. And it's the same with the plants. It's more of a long-term effect on the soil and the plants when you use organic materials rather than that quick burst that destroys the soil life and then everything has to recover and if it doesn't recover then you just have to keep resorting to more synthetics and it's a downward spiral that i just think it's best to avoid if we can uh ken's asking a question what's the best organic way to make your soil prepared for a garden i love that question and um the answer to that and for growers basically across america and i've lived almost 10 years in florida where the soil is sandy and people are dealing with the issue with sandy soil that the water just passes too quick that if you fertilize you lose your fertilizers too quickly um and again the soil structure is just poor so for those of you that live like in a sandy soil um i have the answer to that as well as now here i am in los angeles california southern california in particular has a lot of clay um and most people hate clay soil and sometimes they can you know even with their shovels with about 10 or 20 minutes of effort can sometimes only get inches of um, you know, digging accomplished. And one of the best ways to improve both clay soil and the sandy soils is mulching, um, which is simply just getting wood chips and adding a good two to three inch layer of wood chips around your plants that you start incorporating into your garden and then maintaining that from year to year. Usually one application is good for about 18 months in my you know experience. And, um, and being here in Los Angeles, we have Griffith Park right next to us where they have a, an unlimited, nonstop, free supply of wood chips, again, that you're going to be using as your mulch. And they also have compost um, resources as available where they're simply breaking down all the trees throughout our city and, um, and grinding them down and making them as an available resource for you know homeowners in your city. And most cities across America have a free source for wood chips. And so um, simply adding, again, a two to three inch layer is going to help improve the soil structure. It's going to um, reduce your weeding by somewhere between 70 to 80%. It's going to save you a lot of time. Um, the other benefits of also mulching is going to, it's going to help you retain water so that you don't have to water as frequently and that's going to save you money. Um, so you, it's going to save on weeding, it's going to save on watering, and then it's also going to help improve um, as it breaks down, it's going to enrich the soil with a lot of the minerals that once went into that tree structure are not going to benefit the surrounding plants that you bring in that mulch. So that's just a few of many reasons that you should all be mulching around your plants in your, you know, in your garden. Are you familiar with chip drop? Um, I'm going to have you define it. Okay, so there's a website, getchipdrop.com, and the Wick Wickershire Project Off-Grid has highlighted that and it is a uh, resource here in the United States I, I understand they might be trying to expand to other countries but it puts you as a home gardener in contact with an arborist in your area and so the arborists that are cutting down the trees and having to transport them to landfills tells chip drop that they've got a load of chips and you sign up on chip drop and they'll dump it in your front yard and it, it's a minimal fee that that you do through chip drop to to get that 
And the, the only downfall, which I don't necessarily think is a downfall, is you get whatever the truck is. So if it's a, a 15 cubic yard dump truck of chips and you've agreed to take whatever's available, you're getting 15 cubic yards of trip of chips. I did it last year and I think I got about five yards of, of chips. It was a smaller truck, but I totally agree with you. Wood chips are, are a great, and when you can get them through chip drop for next to nothing, it's awesome. Now the back to Eden gardening method is all about chips. One thing that's often left out, he, he gardens, uh, if you wanna look up those videos about back to Eden gardening, he gardens in the Pacific Northwest and adds chicken manure to the chips. And that's a, a step that a lot of people who don't fully understand the back to Eden method don't realize that there's the chips and that high nitrogen component of the manure. What are your thoughts as far as adding a fertilizer or a compost or manure on top or in mixed in with the, the chips when you're using that as a mulch? I mean, I would love it in regards to like mixing things in. The other top question that comes in is like, what wood chips are the best? The general answer you get from experts across the country are diversity is the key. So if you're going to be adding manure with your wood chips, if you're going to be adding leaf mold with your wood chips, if you're going to be adding anything, it's all good. But the thing to be mindful of, especially if they're going to be dumping too many cubic yards of product, <laughs> is you don't want to go too tall also with your wood chips. Some people think more is better. Um, and if you go, I would say, in my opinion, over three inches, some people like we go like six inches tall. What ends up happening is you end up smothering those air roots and um, your plants need to breathe as well. So you don't want to go too thick with the wood chips and you don't want to go too thin so that you basically take away from the benefits of, again, offering that insulation, you know, that's going to help you retain water, um, help you to reduce weeding and stuff. But six inches would be excessive. Three is really, in my opinion, like a, a good you know amount. And the other um, key tip is to keep those wood chips away from your tree trunks away from the stems of any of your plants as well as the stems can also absorb water. And when you have wood chips next to it that are like sponges, it can result in a phenomenon known as stem rot. And you don't want those plants rotting because you've got wood chips against the tree trunk. So I usually start very shallow with the mulching and then basically build the two to three inches away and around the drip zone of the, you know, whatever plant or trees that I'm basically trying to protect. Yeah, I, I aim for two to three inches in in my uh, strawberries and my uh, ornamental plants and my pollinator garden and the fruit trees in that area. It's all mulched with the wood chips and, and two to three inches is, is what I'm aiming for too. Thank you to Jordan Marie Organics for that super chat and good morning back to you. Here's the question. Is it possible to over fertilize your plants with organic fertilizers in the same way as with the chemical or synthetic fertilizers? So the answer is yes and no. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to err on the side of yes, you can in the sense of this. Um, organic fertilizer could be something like a cow manure, right? And cow manures are excessively high in nitrates, but the thing that's going to burn your plant is not necessarily the nitrogen in the cow manure as much as the salts that are also within a cow manure product. So when you apply cow manure to your plant, all of a sudden you see your plant suffering. Even though it's all organic and maybe stamped with that armory seal, your plants will still suffer. Um, so the goal is to be mindful. But with an organic fertilizer, the way I see it, is it's as if um, an animal or plant died next to your plant. And so, for example, when a chicken or a bird dies next to your plant, the feathers are offering the phosphorus and the blood is offering the nitrogen and the bones are offering. Actually, that would be um, phosphorus. But the goal is you're getting the elements from the elements of the body, or whether it's a creature or, again, it could be also from a plant that's breaking down offering those elements. So even if it's a big animal or a small animal, it's usually not going to kill the plant it's next to unless it's on top of it. Um, but the point is, again, the organics are the safer way to go. Um, I'm glad you brought up the synthetics again, because synthetics usually are built on salt compounds, usually the other half, like it could be a nitrogen, um, you know, molecule that's connected to like a salt um, background. So when it breaks apart, 
the plant gets the nitrogen but leaves a lot of salts behind in the soil as well mm -hmm. which is an important reason for those of you that are using synthetic fertilizers with the good rains we got here now in southern california all of those salts are now being washed off your property contaminating the environment um but the point is your soil has a fresh start now come spring um with hopefully less salts and hopefully you're gonna follow a better pattern going into 2023. and so you uh you touched on some possible alternatives and and so this raises a good question from dennis ryan because you have your 222, you've got your 333, which which we all call balanced fertilizers. And so I, I encourage soil tests so that you understand what your baseline is of your soil to determine if there's any deficiencies. And Dennis apparently has done that. My soil test says I do not need potassium or phosphorus or potassium. What's the best way to apply nitrogen to tomatoes, peppers, cantaloupes, and seedless watermelons? And so when we have soils that are deficient in nitrogen, like most of us do, and we're growing these fruiting crops, too much nitrogen is going to give us a beautiful plant and no flowers and fruit. So how how do you propose focusing on a particular nutrient like nitrogen, especially with those type of fruiting plants? Excellent question. So again, the products I just shared with you, they're right here behind me, um, are balanced. They're more again across the board just a balanced um you know product if you've already got a couple of the elements one of the first go-to's um at most garden <clears throat> centers that you'll find for adding nitrogen to the soil is usually a blood meal um product so they'll basically you know from the unfortunately it's part of society from the animals they slaughter they yeah. basically take that blood dry it out and turn it into a fine powder um, and that's, that's why great. I thought your your reference to the chicken that dies next to the plant would be appropriate for this question. There's the blood. Um, yeah. So, I mean, but that's one of the most common ways. But keep in mind that even grass clippings um, it, or, you know, have also very high nitrogen as well that you can be um, basically using as your mulch layer around your plants. That will be offering your plants some nitrogen as well. Um, and there are other vegan alternatives also for getting nitrogen, which includes feathers. Um and the same thing when it comes to phosphorus and potassium, like I know um, crushed bones um, is another thing. So bone meal is a good source for phosphorus, which is gonna give your plants a lot of the flowers and fruit. And then obviously for potassium, some people use wood ash, but be careful um, putting too much because it can change the pH of your soil, mm -hmm. make it more alkaline. But um, there's sources for also getting, you know, but for those of you that burn wood, um, you know, consider using those ashes in your garden sparingly um, and using that as the benefit for um, for potassium in your soil as well. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, one of the things we've talked about in past weeks is al alfalfa as a mulch material because it's also high in nitrogen. And I did a video a couple years ago on composting, and urine is actually being used by a lot of gardeners when they want a quick dose of nitrogen on their plants. So. There, there are other options out there if you want to, to look into some of those organic opportunities. Not that I'm implying you're using urine or urea in your, any of your, your uh, fertilizers, but, but it's definitely an option there. And so uh, let's talk real, real quickly here about your background. Those regular viewers of mine know that I had a career in the U.S. Air Force. Gardening wasn't part of my life at all. And then I retired, became a master gardener, and the rest is history. I've got the Gardener Scott channel. And so your background is in, in medicine and law. And so tell us a little bit about your background and how that led you to this point where you've got a pretty big YouTube channel and you're selling organic fertilizers and plant products. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, and first, Gardener Scott, thank you for your service um, oh, this thanks. country. And um, my background, since I can um, go back as far as my earliest memories, my hobby, as many of your viewers, is gardening. And that is their, you know, way to get away from their work stresses, their family <coughs> stresses, their whatever's going on in their life. He's typically going in the garden. And as one of my friends, um, Edgar Valdivia, is a California rare fruit grower here in the Los Angeles area. Um, and, and one of, you know, leading speaker, 
um, within our gardening community. And he always talks about like when he goes to watering his plants, he's like, with the water, my stresses go. And a lot of us, like when we spend time in the garden, it really takes us like, for me, sometimes it's like you're going back into the Garden of Eden or you're going back and connecting with your roots, your ancestry and so forth. Again, I'm telling you, my earliest memories is gardening with mom and 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 from my parents' house, we'd go to my grandparents that lived a couple miles away. My grandfather somehow, and again, since as long as I can remember, we'd spend about eight hours a day in the garden. And for me, and I know for a lot of you viewers as well, um, the goal is to spend all of the days you can and as many hours as possible in the garden um, because it does bring that much happiness and joy. And at the end of the day, it's your health. You're going to be way healthier than the person that's not reaping the benefits and sowing the seeds and, and doing all of that, you know, goodness that comes from it. So my background, again, is it's always been plants. And because I followed, you know, the, my passion for plants and animals, it took me naturally into wanting to be a medical doctor. And I spent, um, in as I approach now my college years, three years in doing cardiothoracic surgery research. So I was working with heart surgeons, going in operating rooms, um, watching them stop human hearts, you know, and and adding those bypass, you know, plugs from arteries that are taken out of the leg. Um, in addition to so many different research projects as well. And it's um, one of those projects that became the um, foundation to our patent in, behind our paint products, which are right here, which hopefully we'll talk about. Yeah, we um, and, and so that's basically how our company started is, um, is with that science and that research that I got in um, cardiothoracic medical research. And I applied for medical schools and I only tried once and it didn't work. And I immediately jumped ship into law. Um, and all of a sudden, within a matter of weeks, I was in law school and doing well at that now and um, and practice law for about 10 years. Even though my education is here in California, I ended up practicing law in Florida. My my, my bar license is on the opposite coast um, where I'm still active, but I haven't used it now in, I think, 12 years. Um, but I do feel like I use it every day as there's so many compliance issues, state regulations, federal regulations. The, the paperwork is through the roof. And I would think any business that wants to be in business usually has a legal team, you know, at hand. And so that's been the value between the science of our products. I always like to find Ivory Organics as being innovative, organic, effective USA made products. But it's that science with the law, I think, is what brought our brand success. And um, and, and that's kind of the summary of, of how the pre-med and the law together, um, you know, came to fruition in Ivy Organics. So let's go ahead and talk about that first big product. And and I think it's probably still your best seller. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But the three-in-one plant guard, I did a video about last year because my climate is such that we really do need to protect our trees. In fact, I was just talking with a friend yesterday who is saying, I need to protect my trees. And so tell us about the, the plant protection and and you can also, I mean, you touched on it, but if, if you need to go back to that medical research to explain how it works, but why why do we need it and why did you develop it? Sounds great. So the, um, the medical research is, um, well, actually, let me go back to why we developed it. Um, the, I kind of want to, this for your audience um okay i'm gonna do this for your audience first can i ask them the question absolutely so and, and so well, before you before you show it let me go ahead and and yeah for anyone who is joining us just now this is there's an opportunity for a giveaway and charles is going to to show a question and if you know the answer put it in the comments and I'll be monitoring to try to see who's first, and then I'll review later to see if I got it right. But if this is a question, and you're looking for an answer. So here's the question. What is the number one most popular season? So I'm looking for the season that commercial orchards in the USA whitewash fruit trees. So here's the question, and I'm looking for someone to write a season down and within a minute, I'll answer the question. And then while you guys are writing that, I'm just gonna share the reason we delved into 
um, this business is we saw that there was a need for an organic whitewash product. And um, historically, not historically, for the last 50 to 100 years here in America, most commercial orchards have been relying simply on just going to um, the big box store, buying paint and painting their trees. Um, for those of you that have seen tree trunks painted white, the primary reason that they're um, painted white is it basically helps control temperature on the plant. You can be doing everything right for your trees. You'll be fertilizing with the right stuff and you'll be mulching with, you know, doing that good two to three inch layer. Um, and you can be watering properly and everything is perfect, but your plants are still suffering. And even if they're growing, they could be not growing to their potential because you're not whitewashing them. And what Ivy Organics wanted to do is to give organic commercial orchards and backyard growers an organic alternative and a healthier way to protect your plants from weather extremes. And so, um, and I'm so why, why, why shouldn't I just take my can sitting in the garage of white latex paint and put it on the, on the tree trunk? There's at least two big reasons. The first one is, um, it's synthetic. Um, your paint in your garage is designed to last a hundred years or more. You put it on your house and it's there forever. Virtually you put it on your plants and the longest it's going to last is about a year or two. Cause as the plant grows, it's going to slough off all of that paint product you put and you're contaminating your garden soil, which ultimately is going to contaminate the environment as well. Um, and if, especially like commercial orchards are doing this like on mass scale and or commercial organic orchards are no longer allowed to put paint on their trees because they're contaminating their soils and they're going to lose their organic certification registrations. Um, so that is um, one of the values that our product offers is, again, it's organic. Um, the other one, too, is if you research when it comes to like um, tree prune sealers that are like latex and tar based products such as paints or tar, um, most research will say do not cover those pruned areas because uh, it traps moisture. These are water impermeable like that you're applying products and your plants are alive. And so there's moisture on the underside of any of these coated surfaces that can contribute to rot to those pruned branches. The other great thing about the Ivory Organic brand products is that they dry on porous, allowing the exchange of nutrient and waters. So again, even if you apply it as a total plant protection on the leaves as well, there's, you know, it can be applied. I was talking about paint. You can spray it on the entire plant, your tomatoes, your peppers, your squash and so forth. Um, and it'll offer protection of the entire plant structure Again, the gardening concept is known as whitewashing. And in an encyclopedia on gardening, it would only be a paragraph. And somehow, and I really feel truly blessed. And again, it's the audience that made this happen. Mm -hmm. On the Ivory Organics YouTube channel, the first 200 videos were simply painting an avocado tree, painting, you know, a citrus tree, painting. Like, that's all we did. And we okay. quickly raised to becoming number one um, as a garden nice. product YouTube channel in the country. Um, That's great. And so, again, just based on that one gardening idea of whitewashing, and I'm hoping this is something that a lot of your viewers leave with is, you know, that and this is, again, what all of the gardening professional orchard growers and another um, person that vouches for this is Tom Spellman, Dave Wilson Nursery, largest dis distributor of deciduous fruit trees in the country. Um, and the saying is that the day you plant your tree, is the day you whitewash it with Ivory Organics. And the reason that you want to whitewash it that day is at the nursery, these trees, and from the time they were created, they've always been in groups. So they've been getting natural shade protection from other plants near them. But once they're planted in your garden, they're immediately exposed to too much, um, come summer, 14 hours of light. And in the winter, for a lot of us, we're dealing with also um, frost, it, especially in the nighttime low temperatures. And it offers insulation from the coldest nights as well. So it curbs those weather extremes. You can result in a happier plant. Um, okay, so not... there's a lot of people that that gave the answers that you would expect, and they obviously didn't remember my video where I was putting the whitewash on last fall. And so Joni was actually the first one. I'll give her credit. She was probably typing so fast she misspelled it, but Joni was the first one with the correct answer. And so. Um, first, and and one of my 
moderators Jay is going to be right on top of this I'm sure she'll give a link to my video if she hasn't already because I explain all of it but what's your reasoning for fall being the correct answer for whitewashing so it's not my reasoning you can google it or wherever you do your research and you'll see that the commercial orchards across America their number one season for whitewashing their trees is in the fall because <clears throat> the risk and the damage to the plant is even greater in the winter and that's the reason like with the question that i said in the united states because for us here in southern california we don't deal with maybe damaging freezing cold nights that can harm our apple trees and peaches and plums and so forth um but the number one reason across america for whitewashing your trees is predominantly protecting them from what's called winter sun scald and winter sun scald where you have warm days that could be in the 60s and 70s followed where the fluids in the tree will start to move. And then um, by night, when the temperatures dip into the freezing zone below 32, the um, underlying cambium tissues will begin to freeze. And that results in cracking and, and basically damaging, even if you don't see it, below the bark surface, you're basically damaging the cambium tissues, which are basically the vessels of the plant, the xylem and phloem, which are moving the sugars and waters um, and, and more below the bark level. And if there's any harm to the cambium layers, you're ultimately harming the health and longevity of your plants and trees. So um, that's the reason whitewashing in the fall will protect your plants best through the winters that are more damaging for, again, those commercial orchards than the damage you get from the summer. But it is in the spring and summer that we notice is the spike in when our products are most sold. Yeah. Most of us are spending more time in the garden and protecting our trees then but it is also protection from damaging summer sunburn. Let me hold the can up again um, and I'll tell you. So here it is. So it's the Ivory Organic 3-in-1 Plant Guard, protection from damaging summer sunburn, insects, and rodents. And the way the science now comes into it, my background is when I was working in cardiothoracic surgery, we used a um, antibiotic called amicacin that we encapsulated in these fats. And at the site of surgery, we would put in these lipid encapsulated amicacin at the site of surgery that would break down over the course of several days to about a week or two, basically preventing infection at the site of surgery. Antibiotics typically break down in a matter of hours. And by encapsulating them in the fats that the body would break down, releasing continuous antibiotics at the site of surgery is what was the novelty in this product. And similarly, the way this product works is it has seven natural oils, which include castor, cinnamon, clove, garlic, peppermint, rosemary, spearmint, all these oils that are naturally insect and rodent repellent, in addition to like disease control as well. Um, and so what happens is those are now encapsulated in our base powder, which includes limestone, which is the way it was done thousands of years ago. So some people just put, you know, crushed lime on their tree. Um, another ingredient in our product you'll notice is mica, which is simply clay. And the clay is another way you can put mud on your tree. Um, but both of those alone, if you add water, they're simply going to shed and fall off your plant too soon. Um, the product also has milk proteins, and um, that also helps create that strong bond that helps the product last about a year, which is what you're trying to do, you know, when protecting your plants. And so that's basically mm -hmm. the science is we're basically encapsulating these oils and oils by themselves also don't last that long, but when they're encapsulated and you're brushing it up on the tree trunk, you're also preventing rodents from girdling, which is an issue across America as well, especially in the winter months um, from girdling rodents. Um, when it comes to insects, if you've got one of the, my main memories I remember is an apple tree with beetles and termites that were eating um, the tree trunk. And even though it's still producing a lot of apples, you can whitewash the tree trunk and it'll basically, if the beetles and termites try to leave, it'll damage them on their way out. Any other pests that try to get in will get damaged on the way in. In addition to the oils, there's also diatomaceous earth in the base mm -hmm. product as well. And diatomaceous earth is kind of like crushed glass, but it's um, basically derived from di diatoms, which were single cell shell breathing organism organisms. They actually contribute to the majority of the oxygen in our air. These diatoms basically accumulate in certain parts of the United States and diatomaceous earth, again, is one of the products. The shells are basically crushed. It basically, again, on the exoskeletons of pests such as beetles and termites will basically scratch their shells and they'll dry out if they try to go through the product 
or chew on the product. That's why you can apply it as a foliar to your tomatoes, pepper, squash, or any of your new sensitive plants, and it'll offer them protection, um, mm -hmm. you know, especially as you're trying to get them established. And it also serves, again, whitewashing as an anti-transparent, helping with transplant shock as well. And these are just, again, some of the many benefits of whitewashing. And so here I am again, tying in the science with um, the product. And so Tony O'Neill from Simplify Gardening, a big channel in the UK, highlights it and prevention is better than the cure. And, and that really says it all. It, it's in the fall doing an application. And so for those viewers who don't understand girdling, girdling is when you have, like in my area, it's voles that are the biggest problem, but it could be a, a bigger animal that eats the bark all the way around the tree. And, and that will kill the tree because then there's no opportunity for nutrients to flow up into the branches and the leaves. And so girdling is, is all the way around. And so when you apply a product like this, you're not just applying it to the sun side to prevent the sun scald. You, as you're saying, it's that protective barrier and you really want to apply it all the way around the tree down to ground level. For those of us in with winters of snow and ice and those burrowing animals are scurrying underneath that snow layer and chewing on our trees, it needs to be all the way down to that, that level of the soil. Correct. Yeah. And, and then you can put mulch, you know, around the tree. That's another thing. You shouldn't put the mulch right next to the tree because those varmints will get up and be sheltered from the hawks and the cats as they're girdling and chewing your tree literally to death. And so I, I did want to talk a little bit about trees. And you mentioned Dave Wilson earlier. And Dave Wilson is another great channel. Most of the, the information that I use on how I prune my trees, I learned from watching Dave Wilson videos. And, and you, you have a nice partnership with them, and they're obviously using IV organic products. But often when you are uh, selling your products, you will include a free giveaway with the product. So why don't you tell a little bit about how, how that partnership works and how you're able to give free trees when people order at different times of year. Free trees. Well, you're just doing the um, big tree giveaway. Oh, 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 thanks for the clarification. I'm like, we don't yes. give away true, you know, fruit trees, but we do. Um, every February, and I wish we did this like a few weeks ago. I know there's a huge audience and they're all going to want in on this, but I'll do a plug for someone else. And I brought this here as well, because I do want to talk about Dave Wilson Nursery a little bit more too. Um, but the better, um, the better person right now for figs is going to be the fig hunter it's david and priscilla burke they're um, located just north of sacramento here in california um they've got like 10 acres of property and their specialty is just figs um and and accumulating figs and every year on february 1st and we just concluded our now six um man i can't get the camera right our six free fig cutting annual giveaway. And it's something we started when we had like a, just a few thousand YouTube subscribers. And we wanted to give thanks to those YouTube subscribers when I was pruning my fig trees in the backyard. Um, and I didn't want to just throw those cuttings away because I know they root so easily. And I wanted some of the deliciousness from my property to go to other properties across America. And I think some went to other countries as well. And so we basically gave away the first fig cutting giveaway. We gave away 97 cuttings. I cut them and, and put them in the mail and gave them away for free. And then the second year after having done that and having spent several hundred dollars on this you know, endeavor, I'm like the second year, I'm like, I didn't feel like doing it. And the third year, um, I got a call just a few weeks before February 1st. And this person said, I've got these figs for you. One's a strawberry verite. The other one's a raspberry latte and I've got wow. some tiger panache figs. And I'm like, I want those. And I know my audience is going to want that too. And he already had them cut and ready for me. And, and then from there, I basically shared it with the audience and it took off. We're stuck and married to the idea of making sure that every single year we have these free fig cutting giveaways. And as you said, Gardner Scott, with 
any product you buy the way we did it this year if you buy anything we'll include free fake cuttings and obviously the more you buy the more we include or different products come with more cuttings and um and then we also do a giveaway on all of our social media platforms whether you're on facebook instagram twitter TikTok, like we basically um every single day without a purchase also gave away free fig cuttings and the fig hunter um, contributed about one third of okay. the varieties and what the fig hunter did is he's now accumulated close to 2000 wild fig varieties and he's been taste you know testing them out for the last like five to ten years wow. and from them he's come up with varieties known as like jolly rancher which is like insanely popular there's another one called citron which is a fig with like citrus notes um and then he's got again 2000 named varieties he's got his top 10 and top 20 varieties you can see on his website at the fig hunter shop.com that's a plug for david and priscilla and his okay. family up in northern california um but they've been an integral part of our family for many many years okay. and um and i'm hoping your audience participates and marks their calendar oh, for, yeah. now for february 1st um and i so, would so uh, sorry to interrupt, but let's oh, yeah. lay out a general calendar. Okay, so we've been talking about applying the the three in one plant guard in fall. Uh, we've we've kind of touched around the idea of when to apply fertilizers, and we'll get to your question on that here in just a second. And one thing I want to point out, and and you can add anything to this point, the application on the trees in particular of the plant guard it's not going to last forever so it does need to be reapplied periodically and so as your products go you hopefully gardeners now the viewers will will have a plant guard product that they're applying in the fall and then at some point in a year or two they'll need to replenish it replenishing that in February, before their product runs out for the next year, is actually an opportunity to get a fig tree. And so how often do you recommend the application of the, the plant guard? I think it really depends on the plants that you're growing and what the issues are within your garden. Um, I would say for most gardeners, it's just once a year. Um, and to basically see like how active you are also with the planting, because if the goal is you're looking at weather, and um and depending on how fast your plants are growing or how young they are if they're younger they're probably growing faster and if they're already established you're going to notice that you're going to apply and they're really not going to slough off the product as fast um so again the application just in general is probably once a year um but you're probably also going to want to keep product the products also just to let you know there's an oil free um alternative which is the blue can it's simply just the base ingredients without the oil and then there's the yellow can, and um, I showed you the Armory one, which is color white. Mm -hmm. They're all basically the same ingredients. It's just more applications. Man, if I can get this camera right. <laughs> so here's the Armory. This is color white. And then you can see the other one I'm holding here is gray. There's another one that I love, which is color grayish, um, and which looks really natural as well. This color is green. There's, um, again, so it's green, brown, gray, grayish. There's a whole bunch of different colors that can best match a tree so they don't necessarily have to look white. And a lot of people ask which color is better. Obviously, white naturally reflects the most light and heat and therefore will offer your plants the best weather protection. But just like any color shirt you're wearing, it's going to offer protection. So sometimes if you're wanting to do something that's more aesthetic and doesn't look as noticeably whitewashed, you can use a different color and still offer your plants a lot of the protections from weather extremes in addition to the pest protections that are built into the product. And so here's a specific question from Heidi about um, squash borers and squash plants. So we've been focusing on the trees. You mentioned the diatomaceous earth. You know, that's one of those things for the soft bellied insect pests. But how about for the bigger pests that might not necessarily be affected by the diatomaceous earth, like like squash borers and and other burrowing uh, larva? How, how do you answer this question? So the squash borers would, um, and we actually have had people that have successfully used the spray. Um, I would recommend that you start actually off with the can and make your spray from it. This pine size can makes up to five gallons of foliar spray if that's the goal. I would use the can to make 
the amount of foliar that you'd want. Maybe, um, again, to make a spray bottle such as this, you'd use about a third to a half of a teaspoon of the powder that's in here um, with a few of the oils, and you can create a foliar spray to protect the area. The better protection and the longer lasting protection you're going to get is as your squash is growing is to go with a brush yeah. and brush those stems where you're seeing the pest or again with the preventative which i prefer you would be applying it knowing that those squash beetles may come to visit if they're protected they're not going to visit your squash so all of those surfaces that you protect will be uh, you know the best way great Great. And so we are at our normal time that I would begin the show if we didn't have daylight savings time. So I'm guessing that we might have some people that are joining in with us right now because they didn't know that we would be starting an hour earlier. My guest today is Charles Malky from IV Organic, the IV Organic YouTube channel, IV Organic Products, the author of a book about backyard gardening, and just filled with information about fertilizer and tree guard and plant guard. And if you've missed the previous parts of the show, you can always rewind and watch it from the beginning or just watch from this point and then watch it back on replay. One of the things we're doing today is making this interactive. And so Charles has prepared some questions ahead of time. And if you are the first person with the correct answer, then you will actually be able to get one of the IV organic uh, uh, in, uh, products. That word just escaped me for a minute. So we already have uh, Wormulus and Joni S that have one. Make sure that you send me your contact information to Gardner Scott at gardnerscott.com. And so jumping back to fertilizer, since any new arrivals are here wanting to hear about fertilizer, what have you got for us, Charles, as far as your question? So my third and final question for the your audience is, what is the most important month? So I'm looking for a month of the year to apply. Your organic is your key word, fertilizer. And this is the month in the U.S. If you're outside the U.S. and it's a different season for you, this is the U.S. month. Thanks for the clarification, because I know you've got an international audience. Um, so um, so that's what we're looking for. And um, it's been surprising to see the answers that I get when I teach like a live audience at garden centers. Um, and so I see a month. Yeah, they're popping up all over the place. So I'm, I'm putting up a lot of the if you see your name pop up, it's because you've given me the wrong answer. So I we have a winner. But I'm just showing that uh, it's all over the board. Yeah, there... it's shocking. It's really shocking. That's why, like, I really like these are important questions. And the great thing, actually, with your audience that it's been all over the board is you now know that your audience really is absorbing a lot of good information, good content that is going to help make this your best growing season because you now know not one thing, but you've learned several things so far this morning. Um, you know, and it's good to see that some of your audience is actually getting it right, but. Okay. Uh, so what's the right answer? Right answer is May. May is the right an answer. And I've got a chart to explain it as well. And congratulations, Jordan, for getting it. So and that was actually, here. that was actually pretty quick. I, I want to say that, um, not only did Jordan get it, but he was the second person with a month. So uh, a lot of Aprils, a lot of Mays, um, or, or I should say a lot of Aprils and a lot of Marches, uh, a few Junes. But uh, yeah, tell us, show your chart because I know you spent a lot of time on this. Yeah, I see Nick over there with, he's like, May question mark, question mark, question mark. So um, the reason is, and just to let you know, when I go to these garden centers, everybody thinks, you know, it's spring, it's got to be March, April, you know, those are the most important because you're planting your plants and I need to fertilize my plants. And the answer is yes, you do need to fertilize your plants, but you need to do so in moderation. This here's a chart that I prepared where it shows the fertilizer on one side over here with this is basically the amount application. The maximum dose basically on your fertilizer product is going to be the highest peak over here. The lower amount obviously is going to represent for winter. So across the bottom, we've got winter, spring, 
and then um, summer, fall, and then back to winter. So in the winter, your plant's metabolism is at the lowest point, and therefore you're not probably feeding your plants, um, especially at the soil level, which is a good time for foliar feeding maybe. But spring is the time you start applying some fertilizer. And usually by um, February here in Southern California, really late January, early February, most of us start feeding our plants, but about half the recommended dose of the fertilizer um, that's recommended on the backside of the label. Summer is when the light hours are now peaking. You're dealing with 14 hours of light. The temperatures are warmer. And by June 1st, it's the longest day of the year and your plant's metabolism is peaking. That's when you're going to want to make sure your soil nutrients are most available. The reason I wrote in the keywords were organic um, and, and then the month. The reason for organic fertilizers, you want to apply them at the maximum recommended dose dose in May is because you want the soil biology to break those down to make sure the elements are readily available to your plants come June. Um, so June is the most important time for those of you that are synthetic gardeners, which I don't recommend. Um, but for those that are using synthetic fertilizers, you can apply them in June because as soon as you apply synthetic fertilizer, those elements are immediately available. But for your organic fertilizers, May is the month that you apply the recommended dose of fertilizer so that all of those elements are readily available to your plants in the most plant most active months of the year being june um, and again as you saw with the curve you start applying some fertilizer in, in um, early spring um, maximum dose may and then in early fall you apply again a light dose of fertilizer to make sure your plant has all of the elements going into winter as well and, and the key to that, and, and I'll, I'll go ahead and, and stress it as well, is we're talking about the soil. If you're using those synthetic fertilizers and they say apply every two weeks or every month during the growing season, that's because they're immediately available for plants. And so the, or, the key is we're talking organic fertilizers that are working with those soil microbes. And as you said, it takes time for that whole process to develop, which is why you may not even have any plants in the ground in May, and you can still be applying fertilizer to the soil in May, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. And and so I, I, I saw a question, I was trying to go back to it. Um, does it uh, matter for the region that you're growing in, like for, uh, Florida compared to Colorado or compared to, uh, you know, the really cold regions versus the really hot regions? Excellent question. So the answer is yes, it does matter. So I said for us, our spring here in Los Angeles, Southern California area, for most of us, again, it could be in higher elevations and you might have to wait another few more weeks or another month to catch up to where I'm at. But for most of us in Southern California, that last week of January is our last frost date. And that's kind of what you're looking for. Um, once your last chance of frost date has passed is kind of when you want to start adding fertilizers, especially to your trees that are within the ground. You still might not be starting your peppers and squash and so forth and um, for maybe a few more weeks out. But when it comes to, again, your established trees, it's a good time to start integrating some of your organic fertilizers to the um, your fruit trees. So as they go into bloom and they start pushing out the blossoms and stuff, again, those elements are readily available. So they continuously perform at optimal you know, performance throughout the entire growing season. So, um, so again, for us here, we start applying fertilizers typically by late January, early February. Um, and again, if you're in a higher elevation, such as let's say Colorado or Ohio and Montana, you might wait until maybe April or I don't, even, I don't even know if you'd even go into May. What you're looking for really to get the exact answer is you're just trying to find out your last chance of frost date. And then probably that week or a week or two later, that's kind of your window when you want to start fertilizing and integrating fertilizer into your garden. Yeah. And for many of us, that's May. That's the time of year when, when the weather is starting to change and we're starting to, to get those plants in the ground. Now, earlier we talked about uh, over fertilizing. And so Ali Bat had answered your question with every month. So what are your thoughts about adding an organic fertilizer every month of the year? And we may be re-answering or at least saying that what we had said earlier slightly differently. It's the right thing to do if you're container gardening. 
and it's actually on the back of the fertilizer products. If you are, um, if you're container gardening, you're going to want to fertilize every month because as you're watering your container plant, some of that is leaching out. And hopefully you've got a place where some of that water is going because it is still nutrient rich. But all that water, in, especially in your container, it's not holding those minerals as well as your in-ground plants. So for container gardening, in a monthly application is actually recommended. Um, when it comes to, to your winter months, when, again, you saw that curve as it goes really low in the winter months for your tropical plants, which include your citrus trees, your avocado trees, passion fruit, um, and it could be your also your ornamental plants, roses, camellias, um, you know, and so forth. Citrus, I don't know if I've already mentioned, but yeah. adding a foliar feed to those plants in the winter months will help make sure that they perform at their best come spring. Um, a lot of research will show that correcting, for example, on citrus trees or even avocado trees, nutritional deficiencies in the spring is too late. If they don't have all of the macronutrient, micronutrient nutrition in the plant during the winter months, come spring bloom, most of those blooms won't hold and set fruit. So winter fertilizer can be important, but again, in the winter, it's usually fertilizers are applied at the foliar level because the soil in general is colder, damper, and the roots don't uptake nutrients as well as if you did a foliar feed. A foliar feed is a way to get a lot of those nutrients into the plant more readily. Yeah. And, and yeah, I, I completely agree. In fact, I just did a video this weekend, you probably haven't seen it yet, where I was making one of my potting soil mixes and I used the IV Organic 333 in that potting mix. And I'm using that specifically to grow in, in, indoors, in, in a grow tent. And so in a future video, I'll talk again about that, exactly what you talked about in containers you do need to replenish the nutrients for my potting mixes where i'm just doing a quick batch of tomatoes that are going to be going outside in six to eight weeks there really isn't that that need to replenish because once they get into the soil hopefully you've got your soil that's loaded with the nutrients and you've got all the the biome set up to to take care of those plants it's it's the container gardening that we really do need to focus on. And so you've got the 222 product and the 333 product, and, and let's talk about container gardening. What, if any, is an advantage to using one of those products over the other when you're talking about containers, be it a citrus tree or any other type of plant? So, I mean, obviously the 333 plus azomite is our um, most Pride and Joy product, just because it's the most complete. The <laughs> fact it's got a higher NPK means you can use a little less of it. And then the plus azomite up here, it just basically means you're also giving your plants a lot of the micronutrient nutrition as well. Minerals. For us and when we developed, and this is our initial product that we brought to market, is to basically give your plants everything in a single product rather than you know, having to look for a calcium source and looking for a magnesium source and looking for, you know, some crust azomite, you know, for micronutrient nutrition. We, you know, basically called them and we brought these base ingredients all together in a single product so that it can offer your plants everything rather than having to buy multiple different products. Again, to give your plants those six base macronutrients nutrition in addition to plus azomite for micronutrient, you know, benefits as well. And so here's a good question from Shandy's Garden. Uh, a big concern about adding fertilizer in, into my garden hose water. I don't want to kill anything that's in my compost tea. Compost tea is is very high in bacterial action if you're using the aeration method of the composting tea. Uh, right now I can keep up with the dechlorinating, but the concern is if you were to add an organic fertilizer like yours and and make a mix, and mix that with compost tea. Is there any adverse reaction with the bacteria that might be present in a compost tea when you're using an organic product like yours? Um, actually, it would improve the situation as the product being all organic would actually complement and feed the organic bacteria and would help, you know, encourage it. The product does have some beneficial bacteria in the product. 
um, as well to help add to the living, you know, structure as well um, to your compost tea again on the back. And these questions just seem to be lining up so well for me because it is on the back side of the label. I don't know if um, you're setting me up here or not, but there, there is a compost tea paragraph over here where I'm just going to simply read the first sentence says to apply five tablespoons of the Ivor organic all purpose with one cup of compost with five gallons of container. And it does specify to use either rainwater or pond or three day old um, public water, again, for the purpose of the dechlorination. Um, and so the product can be used as well, this fertilizer um, to your compost teas um, and supplement basically your, your hose irrigation and so forth. Um, that product can also be used as a tea as well in the sense of We've got a few products out there which also takes the super blend fertilizer plus azomite puts them in tea bags or you can make your own tea bag formula or you can simply put it like in a sock for example and soak it and use that solution that will basically be rid of any possible um you know products that can block your spray in and use that solution also to create foliar sprays as well and it's a good practice even though we talked about foliar um, feeding in winter it's a good practice to be foliar feeding also throughout the year when you're talking about like the biggest pumpkins and the biggest tomatoes and the biggest, you know, fruits and vegetables, the, those gardeners that achieve the like the, the best record results are usually foliar feeding in addition to feeding the soil and biology as well. So by doing both, you'll actually re result in much bigger, better, you know, happier plants um, if you complement the soil with foliar feeding throughout the year as well. So I do a lot of top dressing. If I'm if I'm using a slow release fertilizer and I just want to throw a little bit in outside that May time frame, I'll put some on the top and just scratch it into the soil as we move into the fall typically. And so to the container gardenings or even to the the bed gardenings, when we are applying the fertilizers you're talking about, would you recommend a top dressing so that it it resides with the soil or would you recommend the liquid application where we are dissolving it into the, that five gallon container and then applying it? I mean, the easiest application is to just top dress it. So simply take the products and scatter it on the surface of the you know soil. And even if you've got wood chips as well, I know a lot of people like move the wood chips and then apply the soil. The product will work its way straight to the um, the top soil with the first watering. So just apply the fertilizer. If you've got that two to three inch layer and just water really well, and the, the fertilizer is going to find its way right to the, um, the top soil as well. And with every watering for the next three months, your plants are covered also as the soil, as the fertilizers continuously break down, feeding that soil biology and ultimately benefiting the surrounding plants. Yeah. I'm, I'm a relatively lazy gardener, which is why that's the approach I take as well, yeah. is just spread it on top. And I do the same with compost. You know, the, the compost tea, I, I look at the same way. I just as soon spread compost on the soil. And then every time I water and every time it rains, I'm basically applying compost tea. And, and so I've gotten more and more in the habit of, of the beds that I know are deficient in nutrients of actually mixing compost with a fertilizer and then spreading that on top of the surface. And like you said, about every three months, every time I'm watering, I'm letting those nutrients soak into the soil. It's that's easy. An, yeah, that's an excellent practice to also be adding compost in addition to you know fertilizer and composting around all of your fruit trees on your property. As we talked about with wood chips, compost also you know is an easy way to help improve that the integrity of the topsoil. And again, we're not, I'd say about 90, 95% of our trees that we've got on our property that we're growing in our food sources are not native to our areas. And so um, we're also dealing with a biology for these plants that's different historically from what they're used to. So um, what I'm leading to is like the, the leaf mold, the leaf litter um, and everything else like is, um, is different from the way it once was like for example our citrus trees are native mostly to australia um in that environment and a lot of people ask like for example like why do i have to go through all of these different steps in order to have a successful citrus tree here in let's say colorado and the, mm -hmm. the, the point is you've got to give it these additional safeguards in order to accomplish you know growing success um 
And again, by composting, by mulching, and then by fertilizing, you're giving your plants everything that they'll need for a maximum success. Absolutely. And so uh, there's, uh, it seems like there might be a, a little bit of um, misunderstanding or maybe not fully understanding. Two gals is wondering about the appropriate product. So we're actually bouncing back and forth between the three in one plant guard and the fertilizers. And so when we're talking about our, our vegetable garden, could you differentiate between those two primary products, the, the fertilizers you have and and what's appropriate, and then how the three-in-one plant guard plays into vegetable gardening? Absolutely. So the fertilizers are obviously there to offer your plants all of the macronutrient, you know, which is your NPK as well as magnesium, sulfur, and calcium. Your NPK is your nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. So your fertilizers are there to make sure your plants have just as you know, you and I go through our every day with breakfast, lunch, and dinner, trying to hopefully bring in the best nutrition into our body so it gives us health. Similarly, similarly, you're feeding your plants to give them all of the macronutrient nutrition so that they can bloom and support fruit if it's a fruiting tree and grow and be green and do all the things that that plant's supposed to do, um, you know, to its maximum ability. That's what the feeding and the fertilizing is doing. The three-in-one plant guard is basically protecting your plants from pests, from weather extremes, and from disease, depending on how you're using the product. You can use it on your vegetable garden as a um, now foliar spray. And again, you can use the can to make the sprays. Um, and one of these little pint-sized cans makes about 22 to 25. Again, it makes five gallons if the goal is to spray the product. Man, I keep spinning it the wrong way. Um, okay. And so the can can make the spray bottles or a lot of people just like the fact that it's ready to use and they can spray it on their plants. By spraying the entire plant structure, you're helping it with as an anti-transparent with transplant shock. It's going to help curb, you know, sometimes you're planting your plants in 70, 80 degree weather, but you'll see your plant wilting. Whitewashing is going to help the plant better transition in your garden and then also keep it pest free as well as you've got these oils the 3 one plant guard has those seven natural oils in addition to diatomaceous earth so your plant that you're integrating in your garden are pretty much untouchable from pests as they then get established in, on your property um and so that's basically the three-in-one plant guard um and then you talked about with your vegetable garden so i guess i'll stop there because when it comes okay. to your fruit trees the application is going to be different as you're probably going to be whitewashing tree trunks and lower branches okay Great. And so so that that's the key takeaway is that they're two completely different products. They just happen to both be under the IV organic name. And it all comes down to whether you're protecting your plants. As, as Tony said earlier, the, the protection is more important than dealing with the pre, or prevention is more important than dealing with the problem later on. And then, of course, the, the fertilizers are are there to to be used and and i i'm a big proponent with the soil building the soil organic materials in the soil and so for a gardener like me that as we've been talking about it's the container gardening that i think really throws a lot of gardeners where they listen to someone like me that says build your soil and it will feed your plants and then they start try to grow in a container and it doesn't do well and it's it's partly because as we've been talking about, you need to keep replenishing those nutrients in your containers. I saw a question, I tried to go back to it, but I, I missed it, about growing trees in containers. So um, they were asking about apple trees in, in particular, um, and, I, and you have talked about growing the lemon trees, and, yep. and, I, and I wanna give you the opportunity to at least show your lemons, but uh, what are your thoughts about growing trees in containers? I think it's a great idea. And for a lot of us across America, we've got one either limited space. If you're living in an apartment, condominium, townhome structure, container gardening might be your only way. Um, and when it comes to growing trees in container, something to be mindful of, regardless of what that fruit tree is. For example, you mentioned an apple tree. I would recommend that you stick to either a dwarf. And my personal preference is semi-dwarf because they're a little bit more vigorous. Um, and to never go with a standard size tree for a container 
lifestyle as standard trees in general. And again, there's different rootstocks that can be on, but standard trees mean they want to grow to be about 20 to 30 plus feet. Um, compared to if it's on a dwarf rootstock, you might end up with something about two to three maximum, usually about five feet. Um, and But the growth you're dealing with on a dwarf is usually a few inches per year mm -hmm. compared to a semi-dwarf, which, which can still push out several feet. And then you can, with pruning, keep it in check so it's the size you want it to be. When it comes to container gardening, again, for your fruit trees, um, try to give it a nice home. You know, I'd say at least a 15, 20 gallon container would be ideal um, for a semi-dwarf fruit tree. And you will be able to enjoy fruit. There is a lesson on the ivoryorganics.com website with um, an individual that's growing citrus. And I've got a few here that I just picked a few minutes ago from my garden. Um, and those are lemons. And um, Al um, Wil Wilcoxon in Canton, Illinois, so you know like how cold the weather can be there, has been successfully growing his citrus trees from Four Winds Growers, another plug-in for them. Um, and Four Winds Growers basically ships citrus all over the country, uh, all over the country, and um, and he's basically bought these small fruit trees. You know, I think about a gallon size, you know, fruit tree that is now producing, you know, 10, 20, 30 lemons, oranges, whatever citrus he's growing, um, and he's doing it in a container um, garden. And there is a link on again ivoryorganics.com where it talks about how to successfully contain a garden. And, um, and basically protect it with feeding it, preparing the soil, watering, and so forth. So, um, but container gardening is the way to go, especially again for those areas that deal with freeze and those mm -hmm. plants that can't tolerate freeze. And you just got to find a way to either shelter them in your garage or um, as Alan Canton, Illinois does, he basically has these grow lights that he pulls them in for a few months and supports them um, until it's warm enough to pull them back outside. And then you can enjoy a lot of the other fruits that you otherwise wouldn't be able to enjoy um, in your particular grow zone. So container gardening allows you to really do what otherwise cannot be accomplished. So let's go ahead and finish with this question from Yankee Sister Homestead. Uh, I have a three-year-old Meyer lemon tree in a container inside and it's dropped its leaves. Should I be fertilizing during the winter, specifically lemon trees? Yep. So lemon trees, I just want to share, are my personal favorite of all of the fruit trees that I'm growing in my property. And I've got a lot of fruit trees, I think close to 25 fruit trees growing right now. Um, but these here, just in regards to lemons, I just want to share with you the difference. This here is a Ponderosa lemon. And then this one here is the Eureka lemon, the store-bought lemon you're most familiar with. And then this one here is called the Genoa lemon. It's an Italian lemon. Um, they usually get a little bit bigger, but always smaller than the um, Eureka lemon. So if you're looking for like a nice, easy to use size lemon compared to the Ponderosa, which is a delicious tasting lemon. Um, but these are huge and they actually get about twice as big as this. Um, this was the biggest one I could find this morning. Um, but when it comes to fertilizing in the winter, citrus absolutely should be um, foliar fed um, in the winter months. You can add a little bit to the soil, but keep in mind that during the winter, um, most plants usually uptake nutrients better um, via the leaves. Um, and even though the plant lost its leaves, it could have been a whole bunch of different stresses. And um, Four Winds Growers actually on their social media was showing, you know, a plant that dropped all of its leaves one year, the following year still had by spring a completely new set of, you know, leaves. It looks as if nothing ever happened to the plant, flowers and fruit. So um, just hang in there. Plants, you know, can be finicky. Most of us are familiar with ficus trees. If you move them from one corner of your room to another corner of the room, they drop, drop their leaves, the leaves. And, some, <laughs> and they sometimes die um plants similarly everything you do to them is a stress whether you're pruning them or fertilizing them or watering them like whatever you do is a stress but hopefully as you better get to know your plants um they're just going to keep getting better and every year they actually get a little bit hardier um so it's going to be harder for you to also fail and um and and you're going to find your strengths you're going to learn your weaknesses um, and it's maybe not necessarily you, it's also your particular climate, your grow zone, your timing of the year. If you failed with tomatoes this week, don't give up, just wait two weeks and try again. Um, and so it, it's, it's all about timing, location, soil, and, and just keep in mind that every year you're getting smarter at it. And that's what's so great about gardening is um, you just end up being better with every passing year, regardless of who you are and where you live. 
Fantastic. I, I try to end my live streams with a moment of philosophy and encouragement, and you just did that for me. So very well said. I do appreciate it. And I want, I want to thank Colorado Bird Nerd for that super chat contribution. Thanks to me and to you for a great Monday chat. I'm going to try a couple columnar apple trees this year in containers. So Charles, thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate the wealth of information that you offer. And uh, I, I look forward to, to seeing you again. I know that we will have that opportunity. So thanks for sharing your time and your knowledge with this wonderful gardening audience. Thanks for having me. I have one last flyer I want to share with your audience. Okay. Oh, that's Is right. This. So for your audience, if you use promo code GARDENER, you get 10% off the entire store at ivyorganics.com. There are some plants that we do have, by the way, from Dave Wilson Nursery. So I see how this is all plugging in from earlier today. Um, okay. Available at ivyorganics.com. There's still some pomegranates and blueberries and um, boysenberries, among other plants that you'll find um, in the nursery selection. And, um, you know, I encourage you guys all to you know look for those. And thank you again, Gardener Scott, so very much for having me and sharing um, you know, our gardening world with your audience and, and looking forward to our next one. Yes, absolutely. Well, thanks, Charles. Have a good day. And I'll, I'll let you get back to, to <laughs> your day right now. Well, dear. Thank you. So I thought that was a lot of fun. Hopefully you learned a little bit more about fertilizer and you're well on your way. Definitely be sure to check out the Ivy Organic. I've got links, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, if you're catching up late with us to Charles' book, to his YouTube channel, and to the IV Organic Store as well. So thanks for being here. Guess what? We're going to do it again next Monday. So hope to see you here. Remember that the time has changed. So if you're not practicing daylight savings time, the show will be an hour earlier than we normally do. Always great to see you all. Thanks so much for the questions and the conversations going back and forth. And of course, Heidi and Jay, our wonderful moderators, just do such a fabulous job. I'll see you here next week. I'm Gardner Scott. Enjoy gardening.